good afternoon and welcome to SphinxCon 2014. Please welcome to the stage the Director of Conferences and Education at the Sphinx Organization, Xavier Verna. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Woo! Awesome, awesome. Welcome, everybody, to SphinxCon, the second annual convening on diversity in the arts. Uh, I just want to take this time to just say a few thank yous before we get into the things that we got to look forward to this weekend. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you and to our presenters who are going to be with us this weekend. Big round of applause for everybody. Um, also want to take this time to thank our funders and our sponsors and our host, uh, the Marriott, uh, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, Ford Foundation, uh, Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs, uh, Masco Corporation Foundation, and Google, that without their support, this event would simply not be possible. I also want to take this time to thank the Sphinx staff for their support in putting this event together, and of course, last but not least, the SphinxCon liaisons who just come together for this weekend to uh, put this event together and make sure that the engine keeps running and ensure that it is a successful event. So thank you to all of you. Uh, also wanted to take this time to um, remember one of our liaisons from last year. Um, she was our production manager last year. Her name was Tanisha Jefferson and uh, she was our uh, production manager for the inaugural year and she was a fantastic and remarkable human being, and unfortunately she passed away uh, this past summer. Uh, she was a, a stage manager professor at Carnegie Mellon University and also one of the uh, board of directors for the United States um, Institute for Theater Technology, and probably the sole reason why I was able to uh, hold it together last year during the inaugural year. And I know if she were here today, she would say, Xavier, get it together. We got a show to run. So with that, uh, I'd like to transition to the things that we get to look forward to uh, this weekend. Starting off with, we're about to hear some really amazing and inspiring talks. Throughout the weekend, we have nearly 30 speakers uh, who represent uh, the top arts leaders across the United States. Another opportunity that you have is you get to engage and network with these leaders. After each presentation, speakers are going to be escorted to the networking room, and we encourage you to stand up, walk out to the foyer area, and into the networking room, which is behind me, and speak with each presenter. And that is part of Sphinx Con, is the flow of in and out and talking with people. So we encourage that. Please don't feel discouraged, even while the presentation is going on, to stand up and, and leave. Uh, some other fun things, participate in group activities. I can see everybody is like super into the puzzles right now, which is awesome. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen the note on the box that says we have a prize uh, at the end of the convening for the first uh, pod to uh, complete the puzzle. Uh, so you have to complete it on the tables. Um, and uh, also we have um, the Detroit landmarks, which you've noticed on the table. Uh, we encourage you to kind of just move around and explore different parts of Detroit. So if you leave and you come back, pick a different little pod to sit at and learn about a different part of Detroit. We'll be kind of swapping these in and out throughout the weekend, so there'll be more. Um, also, uh, the networking room, don't forget that. There's a little mini stage in the networking room for just to have fun. You can take pictures on the stage, so have fun with that. Uh, we also have our social media. Um, we have our Facebook and Twitter, and also we have the Google community page, which is a new thing this year. Uh, so I want to encourage you to use that because that is a platform that we've created for you to continue these conversations that you're going to start this weekend. We'll be posting questions in the Google community page, and we hope that you will take a moment to post your answers in there as well. Just one point of clarification about Twitter. Um, if you're going to tweet, please tweet to Sphinx Music with a hashtag to SphinxCon. Um, we don't want to use SphinxCon. Uh, the reason is, in your info packets that all of you received, there is a note to text follow SphinxCon to 40404, and that basically is so we can send you updates throughout the weekend uh, and kind of keep in touch with you. That's not going to be used for our regular media, so please just use at Sphinx Music. 
other things to look forward to. We're going to witness amazing performances this weekend. Starting today, we'll have the Sphinx Virtuosi, which is comprised of laureates from the Sphinx competition. These are all professional musicians that will be on stage here. Uh, we have tonight the Arthur L. Johnson Memorial Series with Simone Shaheen. We'll get to hear him play his oud and his violin tomorrow. We'll have Adrian Anantuan, Gabriela Frank, Mark Clegg, who will be accompanied by two singers. Uh, and on Sunday, of course, don't forget about our Sphinx Finals competition, which is at 2 p.m. at the Max M. Fisher Hall. Uh, also, while you're here, I hope that you take a moment to visit one of the places that we've listed in your program book and explore a little bit of Detroit. Um, and uh, also, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra has a concert tomorrow night. So if you're looking for something to do, 8 p.m., their Divine and Dvorak concert, they've given you discounted kind of tickets for that, uh, starting at $15, code word Sphinx. So I hope that if you're looking for something to do, you can do that. You can pick up the tickets at the box office, or you can do it online. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass on the mic to Ms. Jennifer White, our SphinxCon host for this year. Thank you all so much for being here, and let the conversation begin. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we? Great. Great? How many Michiganders are here? All right. I, I want to say congratulations on surviving so far. It has been a brutal winter, but you're here, so thank you. If you're not from Michigan, we're just going to give you a heads up. The roads are a little rough right now. It's a little like playing Frogger, so watch out for the potholes. But it is worth the risk to explore downtown Detroit. Um, there's some wonderful opportunities here in the art, beautiful museums, wonderful restaurants, and we really encourage you to get out and explore a little bit in between your conversations and solving puzzles. People are really into these puzzles. I'm seeing two people right down front who are working really hard for the prize. That's good. I, I think the puzzles are good for you to hold in the back of your mind over the course of this weekend because, as you all know, the question of how to improve diversity and equity in the arts, it's not a simple question. It doesn't have a simple solution. But I think over the course of this weekend, what you're going to hear are a lot of little puzzle pieces that can fit together and aid you in your work and your organizations. And so hold that in the back of your mind, find the pieces that work for you, and find the people who you can also fit together with. Sound good? All right. So again, thanks for being here this afternoon. Without further ado, let's get started. So our first speaker is very familiar to most of you here. Aaron Dworkin is many things. He's an author, a social entrepreneur, accomplished artist in his own right, a former member of the Obama National Arts Policy Committee, and President Obama's first appointee to the National Council on the Arts. He's a 2005 MacArthur Fellow and, of course, the founder and president of the Sphinx Organization. Aaron's list of accomplishments are long, but through his work in every sphere, he's shown himself to be a passionate advocate for youth education and diversity in the performing arts. And I'm also very pleased to call him a friend. So without further ado, please welcome Aaron Dworkin. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sphinx Khan. I will just delve right in. Late last year, it's in December, I was looking at the special report that came out from Musical America. And for those of you who don't know, this is kind of a Bible in our field. Uh, it gives us, obviously, a lot of the core information about things going on in the arts. And this was the cover, and it was focused on the key influencers in the field, top leaders. And I noticed something that probably many of you are noticing, especially given the focus of our convening. <laughs> there was not a single black or Latino on the list. And as I looked at it and was disappointed, I also thought back and I realized that the year prior, when they had a very similar list, their list of rising stars, there wasn't a single black or Latino on that list either. And so this led me to think, is it possible there are no black or Latino current or future leaders in our field? even though blacks and Latinos represent over 30% of our overall population and the majority 
in many of the urban centers where key influencers are based. And when I thought about this, I really don't think this is a musical America problem. It's our fields problem. And I think that for two reasons. Number one, there is a smaller pool of black and Latino leadership. And we have to be honest about that. When we look at American orchestras, there's not a single black or Latino CEO of a major American orchestra. I wanted to share with you the information about presenters, but unfortunately, we don't accurately track even what those percentages are in terms of the CEOs of our major presenters. So there is a lack of existing leadership. But I do also know that there are some existing leaders who are of color in our field. And the question we should ask ourselves is why aren't we recognizing them? Why aren't we acknowledging them? The unfortunate reality is when you get to be on a list of key influencers, it makes you a little more influential. <laughs> you get to put it in your bio, you get to share it with other people, and the reality is more people pick up the phone, which means you have a greater ability to make a difference in the role that you play in our field. So these things and these lists actually do matter. And unfortunately, this exists in our field despite the fact that blacks and Latinos are recognized in basically every other major field. And whether we look at business or academia or sports or the law or politics, our overall society, I even included GQ in here, there are blacks and Latinos on every single list that I could find of every major other field. So we stand out as an outlier that we somehow are not engaging new leaders, incubating them, encouraging them, and we're certainly not recognizing the ones that exist. Last October, I gave an uh, address at Carnegie Hall on inclusion. And it was a pretty stark address, and I kind of raised some realities about the orchestral field. But what I wanted to share with you was some of the reactions in the field. And the reality was that in the week after the event, which was kind of when we got the biggest response. There were less than 20 positive comments on our site or leading arts organizations' websites. And of course, the internet is where a lot of discourse takes place these days. And when I'm referring to these positive comments, it's a very general term. And what I mean by that is, for us at Sphinx, positive is not necessarily agreeing with us, but engaging in a constructive dialogue with us. So there were less than 20. There were over 140 negative comments. And by negative comments, I don't mean just disagreeing with us. I mean negative, and I'm actually going to share with you some examples of those comments, not to draw attention to them, but to draw attention to the disparity, and so that you see that literally seven times the volume of feedback we got were these types of comments, and which actually led us to have to shut down our own YouTube site for several days. When are whites going to get tired of being lectured by non-whites in the civilizations that whites' ancestors built? Stop trying to make a silk purse out of a coon's ear. The niggers are a race of wake up, white man. These are all direct quotes. I was told most orchestras make people audition behind screens so that the people judging them won't know if they're male or female or what race they are. They do this to avoid charges of discrimination. An interesting point that I would like to respond to, except that they went on, to say, knowing this, how can this nigger claim discrimination? Obviously, the best people are getting the jobs. Look at how many Asians are in symphony orchestras. What this nigger is saying is hire blacks whether they're good enough for the job or not. Darkies will be given free tickets. I won't read this whole one, but you can obviously get the gist of it. Once they replace enough whites, then they replace classical music with whatever crap they produce, and sooner or later, it'll all be drums, babble, and booty shaking. And while I love to shake my own booty, <laughs> it's not exactly the type of work we're trying to do. OK, we get it. There aren't many darkies in orchestras, but how many darkies are there in the audience? And actually, aside from their verbiage, which I would prefer they used alternatives, it's an interesting question, and one that I might speak to at the next Sphinx Con. So my point in raising these is to share with you that seven times the volume of feedback that we received was of that nature and not the nature of the dialogue and the types of conversations that are going to unfold here over the next several of days. There is a silence in voice and there is a silence in action in our field 
And that silence permits that type of language and dialogue to take the main stage. And it's that silence in voice and that silence in action that permits our field to stand alone with the type of lists that lack any black or Latino membership. And one last thing before I get to my little Sphinx list that I drafted for you is that oftentimes people share, especially about key influencers with me, they say, we'd love to, but we just can't. We try to diversify our board. We try to diversify our CEOs, but it's just, it's tough. We can't do it. And I could spend a whole hour talking to you about that, and I have very, very limited time. So what I wanted to do was just share with you one example, and that is the National Council on the Arts. And this is the board that oversees the National Endowment for the Arts. It's about a quarter black, a quarter Asian, almost a quarter Latino, and half male and half female. You basically don't get a better snapshot of diversity than that. For every single member of the National Council on the Arts, the White House administration needs to identify and recruit someone. Then that person needs to be vetted by the IRS and the FBI. Then that person needs to be confirmed by the Senate of the United States, and we can all imagine what process that is like these days, and ultimately publicly appointed by the President of the United States. There is not a single arts organization in this country that goes through that type of process that is usually more than a year to bring a member of their board of directors into their organization. And yet, there is not a single major arts organization in our field that I am aware of that has this level of diversity. Being inclusive is possible, and it is not rocket science. We're just not doing it. So with that said, while we have to do more to nurture, develop, and encourage future leadership of color in our field, I thought of a few examples that could already be thrown on a list, and I thought I would share them with you. I'm going to go through these very quickly, probably less than 30 seconds on each one. Feel free to look at the podcasts, look online afterwards. If you aren't in touch with many of these people, some of whom are in the room or even speaking uh, this weekend, I would encourage you to be in touch with them because certainly in my role at Sphinx, they are key influencers in our field. So I refer to it as Sphinx America's top 20. We'll start with Toni Marie Montgomery. She's dean of the School of Music at Northwestern, their first African-American and female dean, and the only African-American dean of a top 10 music school in the country. Roberto Diaz is president of the prestigious Curtis Institute of Music and, of course, principal, was principal viola of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Lee Koontz, who led the oldest community music school in the country and was the longtime head of education at the Chicago Symphony, is now executive director of Ballet Hispanico. Maria Rosario Jackson, who's senior advisor at Kresge for arts and culture, and is probably one of the leading voices in the country on understanding the social impact of the arts. Yvette Campbell, who's a certainly leader and shaker in the New York scene in arts and culture and leads the Harlem School for the Arts. Mario Garcia Durham, who's president of the Association for the Performing Arts Presenters, and of course, longtime head of presenting at the NEA. Aaron Flagg, who's dean at the Hart School and one of only two African-American members of the board of directors of the League of American Orchestras. Francisco Nunez, the powerful founder and artistic director of the Young People's Chorus of New York City, which is an incredible institution and is a recent MacArthur Fellow, commissioned over 70 works directly himself. Daniel Bernard Roumain, who's a groundbreaking composer and performer, and literally has had these collaborations from Philip Glass to Cassandra Wilson, Bill T. Jones, Savian Glover, performed with Lady Gaga on American Idol. Whoever does that, classical music in Carnegie Hall to performing with Lady Gaga is a key influencer in my book. Ron Gallman, who is sought after in terms of his lectures and speaking about the repertoire in our field and is the longtime director of education at the San Francisco Symphony. Tanya Leon, Grammy and Pulitzer nominated composer. Darren Walker, we cannot forget, of course, about key funders in our field. President of the Ford Foundation, the second largest philanthropy in the United States, a driving force behind Art Place, significant arts funder. Gustavo Dudamel, nothing more need to be said, but I don't have him on the list because of his role as a conductor. I have him on the list because of the role that he plays as a key influencer, especially when we look at the community outreach efforts of orchestras, not only those at the Los Angeles Philharmonic, 
but the way in which many other orchestras have looked to them as a lead for things to do in their own communities. Stanford Thompson, who's founder and executive director of Play on Philly, probably one of the leading El Sistema models in the United States and is on the faculty of the Abreu Fellow Program at NEC. Abel Lopez, who you'll hear from very shortly, Associated Producing Director at Gala Hispanic Theater and is Chairman of the Board of Directors of Americans for the Arts. Andre Dowell, I had to give a shout out to one of our own at Sphinx, and not because I am just biased, which of course I am, but because in his role as Artistic Administrator of Sphinx, he oversees 30 orchestral partnerships, which results in those dozens of performances every single year that never otherwise occurred in the history of orchestral performances in our country. He also oversees the Sphinx Virtuosi, which despite their cultural background, is one of the only United States-based chamber orchestras that tours the United States every single year and also was involved in the founding of the Harlem Quartet and the Catalyst Quartet. Maria Lopez de Leon, Executive Director of the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture. Our own Wayne Brown, who we now have welcomed back to Michigan. And after being the long time, yes, give it up. <laughs> and after being the long time head of music and opera at the NEA, of course, now leads the Michigan Opera Theater as one of the only African American leaders of a major opera company. Can't have a list without Jose Obreu himself, who founded El Sistema in Venezuela, which has now seated over 100 youth orchestras, 270 music centers, and reaches over a quarter of a million young people. He's received the Crystal Award, a host of other various things. And I figured I might as well put Winton on the list, because what's a list without Winton? <laughs> so my whole point, and you'll see now a slightly revised magazine cover that I wish I would have seen <laughs> last December. And the unfortunate thing is that I should never need to give a talk like this. We should never need a separate Sphinx list. And I will keep making one until there is one inclusive list that we all are a part of and takes our entire field into account. Oops wanted to leave you with one of Martin Luther King's quotes that's one of my favorites, which is that change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And I submit to all of you that our collective silence about these issues matter. And they matter in terms of how our field is perceived by others, and it matters in terms of those who feel that they have the opportunity to fully participate in everything that the arts has to offer. Thank you all so much, and I am looking forward to the next several days. Thank you all so much. Aaron, before we leave, Aaron, can you come back for a second? Yes. <laughs> so this is one of the great things about this role. I get to do follow-up questions. And you said something interesting in your talk. You said, it's not rocket science. We're just not doing it. And I've been in a lot of these conferences about diversity and equity in different forums. And I want to know why you think it's not being done. Is it fear of those kinds of comments? It's political climate? What is it? It's a great question. And I think I probably would condense it down to one word, which is fear. Um, the reality is that because things have been this way for so long in our field, you have to be innovative. You have to be creative. And innovation, as far as I'm concerned, by definition, means an increased level of failure. To be an innovative organization, you have to have a greater level of acceptance of failure. And our field is fear avoidant, <laughs> is failure avoidant. Um, and we've had tons of failures at, at Sphinx and or risks of failures, just trying to start this conference. We were terrified of failing. Um, and, uh, and so I believe that a lot of people simply have fears. People who are in certain positions to make decisions are either on a career track or involved in an institution where they don't feel the freedom to make certain decisions or they feel reluctant to make those decisions. 
Um, I don't believe that there's an active, um, you know, uh, kind of force of prejudice like some of the absurd comments that I read that's out there and we want to prevent this. But I think what there is a lack of is, you know, I'm going to step outside the box, I'm going to take a chance, I'm going to face this fear and risk a possible failure, individual or organizational, because I know that my fear of inaction is greater. And that's part of what we're trying to do at Sphinx and why we have raised or changed the tenor of some of our public discourse on these issues is because we want our field to know and understand that the risk of inaction is far, far greater than the risk of any initiative that we might try that might not be as successful as we'd like it to be. So is, is part of bridging this divide being willing not just to share success stories, but to also be willing to share those failures with one another. Absolutely, absolutely, for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Dworkin. Thank you, Aaron. Some people question that there's too much focus put on diversity initiatives. And our next speaker says the best path to cultural diversity and equity is not through diversity initiatives, but through systemic change. He is Associate Producing Director of Gala Hispanic Theater and Chair of Americans for the Arts. He is also a member of the Boards of Directors of the Alliance for Inclusion in the Arts, in series and Black Women's Playwrights Group. Please join me in welcoming Abel Lopez. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. I've been looking forward to this weekend for a long time um, with great anticipation. First of all, it is a privilege to be able to spend time with friends and colleagues whom I admire, who are thoughtful leaders from around the country, who care deeply about the state and the future of their communities and the people who live in it. And I'm excited about meeting new people, those of you who I do not know, and to hear what you have to think what you have to say, and to engage in conversation with you. Because I know that I will be better informed after I have that conversation to be able to do my work. At this gathering, I look forward to hearing your ideas about and the experiences with and that of others who are doing exemplary work to advance the goal of greater diversity in our sector and in our society. I come to listen and to learn. I am confident that I will be stimulated, provoked, and challenged. And I have also been looking forward to this weekend for more personal reasons. For in many ways, I am returning home. For those of you who know me, you probably also know that I grew up in the coastal bend of South Texas, near Corpus Christi. However, if truth be known, Michigan is the state where I was born, where I still have family and friends. Michigan is also the home of many individuals with whom I have had the privilege of working with throughout my career. People like Aaron Dworkin, Ken Fisher and Ishmael Ahmad, with whom I served on the board of directors of, on the Association of Performing Arts Presenters. Betty Boone and John Bracey, with whom I worked with through the National Assembly of State Art Agencies. Gary Anderson of Plowshares Theater here in Detroit, with whom I served on the board, TCG board of directors. And Lynn White, with whom I worked on the Helen Hayes Awards. And there is, of course, Maria Rosario Jackson and Regina Smith, who are both with the Kresge Foundation and with whose work I've long admired all leaders who are working for a better Michigan and a country that critically engages all of its people through the arts. So to be able to return to Michigan and connect with people like you who care deeply about the future of the arts and the nation is a true privilege and a welcomed homecoming. And so because I am among family and friends, I know that I will hear things that I haven't heard before because I haven't seen you in a while. But I also know that this is a great place for dialogue. And as we say in Spanish, vamos a hablar al cason quitado. We're going to be frank and we're going to be candid, candid. I will be at ease and comfortable in sharing my thoughts with you. Not because we will all agree, but it's because it's good to converse and to hear pe from people who from throughout the country, to hear about the progress that has been made and how it has been made to hear about the challenges we face today in a rapidly changing world, and to try to understand what diversity means today and how it shapes us, our work that we have to do. 
it is healthy to gather and to learn through dialogue that why we may differ as we seek to find common ground for a more diverse and inclusive arts and culture field and nation. As I mentioned earlier, I grew up in South Texas in a town of about 400 people. It was not a wealthy community. My siblings and I, and those who lived in that community, however, had access to the arts at school through music, drama, poetry, and the visual arts classes and activities that they provide, the school provided. But we also learned and experienced the arts at home through the music we listened to and created, the stories we heard, the clothing and the crafts that my mother and grandmother made, and the foods they prepared. But there was a difference between what I was exposed to at home and that which I experienced in school and the wider world in which I existed. The arts and artists I studied or read about in textbooks, newspapers, and magazines, or that I saw on stage, film, and television, rarely included Latino, African American, Asian, or Native American artists or their works. And if we took school trips, rarely did we go see productions that included such artists. Although at home I knew my family as creative people, we were invisible in the larger world and in the textbooks at schools. It was as if artists who were Latino, African American, Asian, and Native Americans, and their cultures didn't exist. As, it was people, as if people like me, people of color, had no cultural histories. But at home, and in many other homes like mine, things were different. We still had access to an exposure to the artists with whom I was because had become familiar through the educational system, the media, and live presentations. But I also had exposure and access to those of my Mexican heritage and other Latino cultures. I witnessed my family playing the guitar, the bass, the violin, the piano, and the accordion. I heard them sing and recite. I watched them create art and connect that art to our, my ancestors as it was passed down from generation to generation. Now fast forward. I left South Texas, graduated from law school, and moved to Washington, D.C. After practicing for two years, I decided, practicing law for two years, I decided to take a theater class. Well, that class led to another and another and finally to enrollment in a two-year acting program. I completed the program and took the next logical step to hit the auditions in DC. It was an exciting time. I imagined being on the stage, eager to show what I was capable of doing. The auditions were friendly, efficient, and many times fun. But after a while, I noticed that the process always ended the same and with the same kind of refrain. You're just not right. Now granted, I never thought that I was the most talented in many of those situations. But I knew that I was trained and had the discipline and ability to understand and create different characters as any other individual who was attempting to seek a role. But the process never changed. You're just not right. So I looked at the context and realized that because of the play that was being produced, who was producing it, and how it was interpreted, there were no part for a Latino, or for that matter, for an African American, Asian, or Native American at least in the minds of those who made the casting decisions. For although the part did not specify that the lawyer, doctor, teacher, businessman, relative was white, it was how he was perceived and interpreted. And after further analysis, I noticed that few Latino, African American, Asian, or Native American playwrights were being produced or developed. And so there was an absence of actors, playwrights, directors, designers, and administrators of color in the Washington theater community. And the same was true of women playwrights, directors, and designers. And it was the same in cities throughout the country. And so, like in the textbooks and in the experiences of my childhood decades earlier, with few exceptions, we didn't exist in the American theater of the 1980s and 1990s. But I knew differently. I knew we did exist in this country, and I knew that we had existed for hundreds of years in the Americas and throughout the world, rich in stories and creative expressions, but with histories known to so very few people in this country. But like the civil rights movements created change for a better America, change also came to the arts and culture sector. With groups like the, the Non-Traditional Casting Project, which is now the Alliance for Inclusion in the Arts, which tackled the problem of lack of diversity in American theater, which held groundbreaking convenings in New York, Washington, and cities across the country, that examined the lack of diversity in American theater. The dialogues were rich and controversial and provocative, but they helped the theater community change, 
to face the lack of, that, of diversity in its work. There was recognition that change was needed, that diversity was a strength, and that the sector's practices did not reflect the values and ideas on which we were founded as a nation, equality, justice, and fairness. I would like to think that we believe that it was wrong for the city, for the arts, to be, not to be as diverse as the people that lived in this country. As a result, countless efforts and initiatives of theater and other arts organizations, service organizations, local and state arts councils, federal agencies and foundations were designed and implemented to address issues of diversity in our sector. And, think, and change did occur. Today, I do see greater diversity in the theater in DC and many other cities across the country. I also see it in the art I see in museums and on stages for music and dance. Now, when the house lights go down and the stage lights go up, I know we'll see more diverse people on the stage and in the audiences. I think it is safe to say that most of us here should believe that our work on diversity in the arts is important and necessary. And we probably agree that progress has been made. But we must continually ask whether the progress made is enough and whether collectively the initiatives have brought the desired change. Perhaps it is no longer just about diversity. Now, when I think of diversity, I think of it as recognizing the range of characteristics that make us in, as individuals unique. These characteristics include, but are not limited to national origin, language, race, color, disability, gender, age, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, and socioeconomic status. Though diversity initiatives at arts organizations have made progress in increasing the number of artists they present or employ, and they have reached audience members who possess many of these characteristics. But has that change been meaningful? And has that change created more diverse organizations and sector? Has this progress led to organizations in a sector that is inclusive? And by inclusive, I mean, have we created an atmosphere that promotes a sense of belonging by appreciating and valuing human differences, where everyone feels respected and valued for their uniqueness? where people are valued because of, not in spite of their differences, so that they can fully participate and thrive. For as a nation, are we not committed to the idea that all people be engaged in the life of their communities with full and equal access to all of the rights and responsibilities offered and guaranteed in our founding documents? And so in creating a diverse and inclusive environment, I also believe that it, is, that it must be one that is fair. And to me, that means equity. To me, equity equals fairness. In an equitable environment, we still recognize differences that are inherent within individuals in order to achieve equality in all aspects of an individual's life. We must treat people fairly. And I believe that fairness also demands remedies to redress historic injustices that have prevented or diminished access in the first place. And so for me today, the more relevant question is achieving equity. Now we should continue to be now, we should continue to build on the progress made in creating more diverse organizations and environment. But representation and inclusion in participation or only as some, a few artists and a few administrators and a few leaders, as is in the past, is not enough. We have to change the systems in these organizations to create an inclusive environment or achieve fairness and treatment. Of, and specifically of culturally specific organizations and artists and women who, and people of who are, pe and all people of color. Now I know what you're thinking. There he goes again, off topic. I know I may remind you of that family member who doesn't remember to play by the rules at the family reunion. But I think I need to be frank about why my thoughts are, are what my thoughts are today and why our work is yet not finished. I concur that there is great value to hear about successful efforts that led to the progress we see. And we will hear about those in the next few days. But we should be careful not to encourage a cookie cutter approach to the issue. And we should acknowledge that the progress that has been made has perhaps, it, perhaps it only affected some aspects or one part of an organization rather than change the organizational systems and environment in which our organizations operate. The work must be a priority for the entire organization that should be reflected in the core values and the mission of that organization. And so we must look at a difficult question, whether the progress has led only to more diverse audiences for the same cultural offerings, from the same perspectives, and with the same type of artists as in the past. And if so, the status quo must change. 
We should ask if the arts and culture we study, encourage, develop, and support through public and private funds continue to exclude those who were invisible in the world I knew as a child in the 1960s through the 1980s and 1990s and who still remain invisible today. Because if little has changed, then we should be talking about changing the systems and we should be talking about equity. And we should be asking whether we have made progress in recognizing the importance and the role that culturally specific arts organizations play and have played in encouraging, promoting, and supporting the artists and those artists and developing audiences and advocates for the arts in our communities. Whose work has been conducted in undercapitalized structures and with less support from public and private funders than other organizations of their communities and fields. We must ask whether this inequitable treatment advances ours, our interests in a more diverse, inclusive, and fair society in which all people in our communities participate and thrive and are treated fairly. I say it doesn't. So what needs to change? We must look to make systemic change. Yes, we must continue to develop and implement initiatives that address particular, particular elements of the issue, but if we want our work to be more symbolic, more than symbolic, we must consider that our work must conceptualize work, our work in terms of changing the whole organization and enhancing institutional cultures. Ensuring meaningful and consistent support from senior leadership that is communicated, that communicates that support regularly and consistently and with, with commitment and passion, which also establishes its performance measures by which we evaluate their conduct. We must ensure that there are sufficient allocation of resources to, to, to the process of change for the organization and for the field. And we must establish accountability systems and the means of engaging individuals in the change process at all levels of the organization. We must advocate that our work is a responsibility of other sectors in our community as well, such as academia and the education, media, government, and the philanthropic sectors. The curriculum, the composition of the student bodies in arts training and arts administration training programs must change to reflect the demographic of the country. The media must increase the coverage of more diverse arts activities and culturally specific organizations in our communities and do so with culturally competent coverage and government and philanthropic support for more equitable treatment of culturally specific organizations must be increased to make change meaningful and to change the environment. And the leadership and workforce of all of these sectors, including the arts and cultural sector, must change to be more diverse and inclusive. It is no longer enough to declare a commitment to diversity by establishing policies and creating initiatives that do not lead to meaningful change in organizations and the sector. We must ensure that the leadership in decision-making positions and staffs are culturally diverse, the resources and the accountability are there in our organizations, and that we must be clear that in order to be accountable, we must establish measurement. We all recognize the value of a more diverse, inclusive, and just society and communities, but we have waited long enough for this to be realized. We must move beyond the diversification, diversification of our organizations through the lens of audience development and symbolic inclusion in leadership positions and staff. We must be part of the change movement and welcome those changes if we are to keep our country's arts and culture vibrant and vital. Now is the time to be part of that change. If we are to remain relevant to and reflective of the society in which we exist and that is evolving as we gather. I am confident that we can make the changes if we take a more holistic approach to changing the structures and systems in which we operate. Continue the individual efforts, but let us commit ourselves to systemic change to achieve inclusion and more importantly, to achieve equity. Thank you.
I'd like to now welcome our next two guests to the stage. They're going to engage in a conversation about creative placemaking. Rip Rapson is an attorney and expert in urban policy. He's also president and CEO of the Kresge Foundation. And Maria Rosario Jackson is senior advisor to the arts and culture program at the Kresge Foundation. And in 2013, President Barack Obama appointed her to the National Council on the Arts. Please welcome Rip Rapson and Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson. <laughs> 